Thank you. Next, Regina Tucker, a family child care provider and member of SAU Local 99. Good morning. My name is Regina Tucker, and I'm a family child care provider in Fontana, and I've been doing that for 11 years. I worked at Bank of America for 31 years, and then my daughter needed uh, child care for my grandchildren. She had difficulties finding flexible child care options. Uh, child care centers are great, but they weren't open late enough and they didn't open early enough to accommodate her hours. And the cost was also unbearable. Now, how many young families can afford $300 a week? So I left my bank job and I watched my grandchildren and I ended up really loving it and got licensed. I was now officially a child care provider with a house full of children. I've always loved ch kids. I love helping them learn in a loving, safe environment as I prepare them for school. But just as it was my daughter's struggles, that drew me into this work. It's often the parents of the children that I care for that keep me here despite the challenges. Uh, one mom is such a fighter, a very determined young lady. She was recently divorced and needed to, to get a great job to support her family. She studied to be a phlebotomist, but after a look, uh, excuse me, but after a lot of looking, she couldn't find a job in that field. So while she was in between jobs, she lost her child care subsidy, and that was also devastating. And it, I've seen it happen over and over with different families. One crisis, losing a job, and then bam, another crisis. And then you've lost the child care that makes it possible to get that job, the next job. But she was determined and never gave up. She applied for jobs online while she stayed home with her kids. She fought to get her child care assistance back. She went to school and today she's ready to graduate with her bachelor's degree in business. She told me the other day that she'd be glad when her income is high enough to afford child care without the subsidy. See, that's the goal. That's why subsidized child care is important. It helps parents come self-sufficient. It helps them move out of poverty. About 50% of the parents in my child care are single moms. Not all need subsidies to afford child care, but many do. They all share a similar determination to make it and make sure their children are successful. They are nurses, retail clerks, teachers, and in law enforcement jobs that uh, require flexible hours for child care. And I'm proud that I, I worked, excuse me, I'm proud that the work I do keeps them, the folks working in my community. I feed the children breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks every day. And I make sure that all the children are ready for school and have completed their homework. I make sure that the littlest ones that I have are, and they tune their little motor skills, they learn their ABCs, their numbers, and they start kindergarten ready to learn and knowing how to write their names. At the same time, I'm living on the edge. I'm barely making it, and I don't see any end in sight. State reimbursement rates have been essentially frozen for a decade. I am told there was an increase last year. Well, that's all a little fuzzy math to me because I don't see any increase. Neither did any of the providers that I know. What's not fuzzy math to me is the cost of my child care that keep going up and up and from food to rent to gas to our staff's pay. I can just make ends meet as long as I keep my child care business full to capacity, but I always feel like I'm preparing for the next financial crisis. I worry about miscommunication with an agency that might lead me to not getting paid. I worry about increasing demands for training because there's no possible way I can afford to pay for additional training. I worry about the minimum wage. Yes, I worry about the minimum wage because I fully support the parents I serve be able to make more money. I don't know how on earth I would be able to pay my assistants the new minimum wage, but I want to pay it. They deserve it. But the problem is that while the minimum wage continues to increase, our rates remain a disgrace and don't reflect what is actually happening out there. State rates are frozen and parents are paying out of pocket are already paying 25% or more of their income and their money can't stretch much further. We child care providers, and this is sad, earn as little as $4.98 an hour after you consider our long hours, overhead, assistance, meals, and learning supplies. What upsets me most is all the talk about quality without connecting the dots back to the money our state needs to invest in us. 
Everyone is concerned about quality child care, but no one wants to recognize that in order to have quality child care system, you have to take care of the workforce. Keeping us strapped to the floor with rates that are so low that we can barely put food on our tables for our own families is no way to inject quality into the child care system. I love what I do, but there are days when I just feel like I can't do this anymore. And thousands of women like me, providers that have been doing this work even longer than I have, have these conversations with themselves every day wondering if they can keep their doors open, and many have opted to close their doors. So I ask today to please join me in really creating a quality child care system in this state that values women like me and the parents and children we serve. So please, I'm asking you to support the Raising the Child Care Quality and Accessibility Act, SB 548. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Jeanina Perez from Children Now. Good morning. I apologize for my back towards you. I can just imagine my grandmother's like, ¿Qué estás haciendo con So I'm just like, I apologize for that. Um, uh, one of Children Now's main pushes has been to see an increase in early care and education for low-income families. And as Regina has pointed out, we also are learning more and more. If we want that to happen, we need to tackle rates, and we need to specifically address the compensation and benefits of this workforce. As more child care and preschool teachers go back to school and get additional training, they are not being adequately reimbursed. As this analysis clearly points out, the EC workforce in California is still on the whole woefully underpaid, even as much more is being required of them and even as much more as they themselves want to get an education. Moreover, the younger the child you are the teacher of, the smaller your salary is, regardless of your education. An average salary for a BA teacher who is taking care of babies and toddlers is $27,000 a year. As Assemblymember Ting pointed out, the average wages, regardless of your education, for a child care worker, $27,000 up to $32,000 if you're a preschool teacher, if you're fortunate to be working 40 hours a week, which many folks cannot do. So once again, how are we going to be expecting folks to really deliver all that we're putting on them, all the requirements if they have to constantly be struggling themselves about their own family's well-being? An increase in professional qualification and skills without a corresponding increase in wages and benefits will only continue what has happened for too long. More and more of the ECE workforce will be leaving the, the early care and education field, moving on most likely to the K-12 field. And this, of course, impacts the, the centers, the homes, and how they can maintain their doors open as well as retain their own workforce and constantly having to train new 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 workers also impacts their bottom line. Most importantly, of course, is we, the families themselves have to scramble if a, cl if a center or a home closes or if they reduces their hours. And, of course, this compromises the ongoing quality for children themselves as well as the continuity of care, which we know is so important for young children. Moving forward, we believe that the Assembly should consider how the three priority areas of access, affordability, and quality move together. We appreciate how each of these issues is really being dug deep, but we really see that you should look at how they move together. Uh, specifically, what we feel is that given the need to continue quality improvements, address parent access to quality programs in their own communities and address the continuous cost pressure to maintain operations, including what we just heard about the recent minimum wage increase. We believe that state reimbursement rate increases are necessarily are necessary. Specifically, we propose increasing the regional market rate ceiling so that families can access 85% of the programs in their own communities. We also support increasing the standard reimbursement rate. And specifically, given the needs for our littlest, littlest ones, we think that we should look at increasing the infant multiplier from 1.7 to 2.3 and the toddler multiplier from 1.4 to 1.8. Also, we believe there should be an adoption of an annual COLA for all early learning programs, and we consider all early learning programs in various settings from family child care, license exempt, as well as center-based programs. Finally, moving forward in the long term, we think we also need to really look at simplifying this reimbursement rate structure and intentionally ensure that providers and teachers who increase their education and training are rewarded via increased wages and benefits. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Questions for any of these panelists? Mr. Thurman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentations. Really just one question, and that is um, if you add it all up, what would you say that the provision of child care uh, represents for the economy of California? Because while taking care of our children is not a business per se, um, I, it, I just couldn't be, I couldn't help but be struck by the fact that we get a double line bottom benefit from this in that our children are well cared for and that those who provide the child care are employing Californians and spending money. You talked about rent and your overhead and your other expenses, and it just struck me that as difficult as it will be to get this house to agree to spend any money on anything, that if you define it as we have an opportunity to help our children and to do the thing that everybody says they care about, support small business, support local business, support the economy, that this would be our opportunity. This would be a place where politically the conversation about rate increases should be driven as an opportunity to support childhood development and business economic development. And so, but I would be curious what the number is if you got a projection of what it means to California's economy, if any of the panelists have a number. I know Marcy Whitebook has done a number of investigations through her UC Berkeley Center on the study of child care employment, and we're talking about, you know, millions and billions of dollars going into it. And it's really a triple bottom line. You know, you're impacting child development right now. You're impacting the businesses like Regina's and, and the centers that are here, but you're also the long-term impact of California's economic, you know, solvency. Like, we need to invest now in our kids in order for them to be able to pay the Social Security of the rest of us as we get older. I missed one of the bottom line benefits. I said double, you said triple. triple. Even better. Yes. Even better. It's, it's, do I hear four? Do I hear five? Well, yeah, <laughs> because more. even the parents, and in, in, um, you're an example, in order for you to work, you need the child care. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're contributing to the economy. Mm -hmm. Four ways. Absolutely. I agree with Mr. Right. Ting's statements earlier. You know, he, he mentioned how much he paid for, for his child care, that he paid less to go to Cal. I didn't go to Cal or Stanford, but I used to say that our child care cost more than Stanford. Um, and uh, I, I agree. I, I couldn't do it. You know, how can we expect our parents to work? Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that there's a conversation for us to have about the economic benefits to the state um, at the same time providing good quality care for our, our young children. And if you all can get any information for the committee or either of the committees, I think it's helpful. I just think that there is a, um, a strong uh, political argument to make um, to try and move policy forward on how the state spends its money, that this is not a handout and that there were statements made earlier in this committee about, um, you know, who works and who doesn't work. And I'm like, well, we all work and we all want to work and sometimes we can't get work but that this is an investment, not just in children, but in work. So I'd, I'd make that case. That's how we should be bringing the argument about rate increases. So in L.A. County and San Bernardino, we have about 5,000 licensed child care providers, and we cover about 10 percent of the state's uh, subsidized child care program. So if you take that 5,000 and multiply it by 10, you'd get a rough estimate of the number of child care providers who are licensed in the state. It's somewhere around 50,000. Those are all people that are running small businesses. They're not just, you know, taking care of children. They're, they're actually running a business. And uh, we also provide about the same number in terms of license-exempt providers, and these are family, friends, and neighbors who are taking care of uh, a child or two or three. Um, so you have uh, quite a bit of income that is is being generated uh, throughout the state. Uh, we put out about $199 million, $100 million a year into the community, and that money then circulates about six times. So, you know, again, if you multiply that number, that $100 million times six times ten, you get a pretty... I, I'm not quite sure what that number is. Six times ten would be something like six billion dollars. How would that sound? Doing a lot of mathematics in here today. I in my head, yes. Um, well, I'm the, other going thing, for that. the other thing that you remind me of, we always talked when we were in local government about the multiplier effect. Every single dollar that we invested, usually it generated, you know, 
three more dollars, four dollars, five dollars. And I think it's important to talk about it in those terms, too. Mm -hmm. Californians making an investment. Mm -hmm. And by investing in our children, we're investing in our state. Who, who, who's going to bring this argument? I mean, we're all going to bring it, but who are the groups that we should be working with? I don't know who's introduced the bills on rates, but obviously this seems to me like that should be the language, that we're not just asking for money. Um, we're saying that this is an investment that's going to continue right. to yield even more investment. So the, um, the Valley Industry Commerce Association, which is a very large business association in the, in the San Fernando Valley, uh, did an did a op-ed piece in the San Fernando v Valley Business Journal uh, last week entitled "Why State Funded Child Care Pays Off." So I'd be glad to give you that. But the, biz the business community gets it; they understand that a lot of their low-end workers are being supported through the state subsidy system. So it, you know, and, they, and if they have s stable child care, that means that they don't lose in it. They don't lose their child care. That means they can continue to be employed. So it, it's an investment for those employers as well. No, we welcome any data that you all can provide for us about number of people employed and the number of dollars that are spent in California or by California's investment. That would be very helpful. Speaking of the business sector, so I think it might be on a, a later panel, but another critical issue is the fact that we are getting the families working and they're in care, uh, but then they in come out too soon. So another proposal to reinvest into the uh, system is to increase the income ceiling so families can stay in the program and rise out of poverty. And by making that investment, they will then start contributing to the system by having a higher copay, and the higher copays then can serve more children. So we would propose increasing rates before slots, increasing the income ceilings up to at least 100 percent. That will actually bring you more slots. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions for this panel? But just so you know, all these pieces, you know, it's a very robust agenda today, and they're all kind of pieces of the puzzle. They're all on our list, and, and none of these are unreasonable mm -hmm. um, asks. And uh, so we're certainly uh, considering them as we go forward to the to the MIR revise. I guess, again, you know, the big picture is these things, these investments are a huge return on investment. You know, we have mm -hmm. Nobel laureate economists to business leaders to people in the military to, you know, bipartisan leaders all saying that bank for bank, biggest investments you can make and return on your dollar is early education. So we're certainly focusing on all these. And we do know, uh, I think, I, I didn't mention this in the last panel, but I think it's important not to get lost on when you're focusing on the subsidized rates for low-income families. It has an impact on centers overall. And so mm -hmm. these are paying customers. And so many times we, we've seen that that with the state withdrawing, it has a big impact, as we saw the numbers overall of licensed uh, centers and just providers in California. So we know, we know they all um, uh, play together. And just lastly, it's, it's unfathomable that, um, you know, child care providers and, and preschool teachers make fast food wages. And, uh, you know, that's the most important thing that we're doing out there is, you know, focusing on the youngsters and the next generation. And, you know, I can see how people would try to go and, you know, maybe get a job. It pays more in an out burger or a retail establishment. And it's hard to think that, you know, we have a system that pays uh, these uh, poverty wages sometimes. And further, many of these people that are in the programs can't afford to pay for their own kids to go to the, to the same programs that they're mm -hmm. providing care for. And so that's something that's not lost on us lost on us as well. So with that, we will go on to the next panel, issue number four on uh, quality and early education and child care programs. And by the way, all these issues are being uh, held open, just a reminder, no action today on anything. Okay, we'll start again with Monique Ramos, Department of Education. Good morning, Monique Ramos on behalf of the Department of Education. I just want to provide a quick brief overview of um, 
our, our quality system and kind of how we, our QRIS system and how we got to this point. So back in 2011, uh, the Department of Education uh, applied for California's Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Grant. Uh, California won that and was awarded $52 million. Then in April of 2013, we were awarded an additional $22 million, bringing that total up to $75 million. That grant required states to produce a quality rating and improvement system. California opted to create local quality improvement and rating systems. So the department, along with our partners, uh, First Five of California, worked with uh, 17 regional consortiums within 16 counties to develop these quality improvement rating systems. They all varied, but all of them have three common tiers that are, um, are unified throughout the state. Um, approximately 77% of these dollars are being spent at the local level uh, through the networks to provide um, consortium work in helping each of the providers to reach these new levels. Um, by the end, but with the funding included in 2013, we believe that nearly 1.8 million children, which is about 65% of, of children under the age of five, will be impacted by this grant. So then moving forward to last year's state budget proposal, um, an additional $50 million in state resources was provided for state preschool quality rating and improvement systems. A total of 23 consortiums were awarded dollars, and we expect more consortiums to be participating this year. At the end of last year, we had almost 3,000 sites participating, which impact 117,000 children. Our target for this year is another 200, I'm sorry, 2,000 sites that would impact another 64,000 children. Uh, no more than 20% of the consortium's block grants may be used for assessing um, assessment projects. 80% is supposed to go directly to providers in order to help them basically get to the tiers four and five of their local systems, which is the highest level of, of quality. Once they reach tiers four and five, they have the ability to essentially spend those dollars on professional de development days, raises, or any other way to help maintain that high quality. <laughs> Additionally, there was a $25 million allocation to the department for transitional kindergarten teachers. 15 million of um, those dollars were sent out in educational stipends for transitional kindergarten uh, teachers uh, through local child care planning councils. Uh, essentially, it's a reimbursement program, and those teachers have until June of 2017 to make their requests um, for those dollars. Then lastly, of that $25 million, $10 million is being utilized for professional development for transitional kindergarten teachers and will be, developed to, will be used to develop training modules and training opportunities throughout the state. With me again, I have Debbie McManus if you have any questions. Thank you. Next, Deb Kong, Early Edge, California. Thanks. I'm Deborah Kong. I'm president of Early Edge California. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today, and congratulations on this joint effort that really links these fundamentally um, close areas between health, education, and early child development. I also want to applaud the legislature for its insistence that uh, in last year's state budget that the state begin to invest, reinvest in early childhood education programs that had been so severely cut in previous years, including the quality rating, rating and improvement systems and professional development. So. That was just a beginning, and we were really glad to see consideration of that in your agenda. I'm going to touch very briefly on three things this morning. What is quality? Why does it matter? And how do we get it? So what is quality? There are two important categories. The first includes more easily quantifiable structural measures of quality, group size, teacher-child ratios, materials, physical features of the classroom, health, safety, lesson plans. The other essential element of quality is the nature of the interactions between adults and children. And researchers increasingly point to these interactions as what matter most, the kind of direct engagement with babies, toddlers, and preschoolers that sensitive, responsive, and stable adults who care and educate for the, care for and educate them have. It's harder but by no means impossible to measure. And through good teacher and caregiver preparation and professional development, it's possible to attain. Why does quality matter? Quite simply because when done well, early childhood education can change the trajectory of children's lives. Neuroscientists, economists, and human development experts all point to early childhood as the time when we can have the greatest positive impact on the architecture of the brain, if we do it right. So how do we achieve higher quality? 
California has successful local efforts and various initiatives to support quality. However, the state still needs a consistent system-wide focus on quality and continuous quality improvement. Some of the most effective efforts to improve the quality of care are those that give teachers and caregivers the knowledge and practice they need to consistently engage young children in language-rich interactions that respond to children's interests and cues. We're very happy to see in the agenda consideration of funding for training at community colleges using Prop 98 funds. We should be reinvigorating the lab schools in our higher education systems, especially now that resources are available. These are child development centers where aspiring early childhood teachers and caregivers can get critical practical preparation under the supervision of college faculty. We, sh we should also be providing compensated, dedicated professional development time to our early childhood educators. It's important to note that professional training and support needs to reach caregivers and teachers in all the settings where they work with our children from birth to age five. We don't have the luxury of saying we'll only do this important work in center-based settings or only in licensed settings. We have to meet the needs of children where they are. We can also do more to support parents in understanding the importance of these kinds of interactions with their young children. So let me wrap up by saying that there's a substantial gap here between what we know and what we do. We have good evidence about what produces the best results for children. So thank you and we look forward to working with you on investments in quality that lay the foundation for our children's good health, social skills, and early learning. Thank you, Erin Gable, First Five, California. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you for inviting me to be here in front of you today. Um, this uh, key issue that we're discussing on this panel um, is how, while rebuilding our child care system, we can ensure that every environment of care is a high quality environment to maximize the state's investment in the child. And we need to make every child care choice a high quality child care choice. Each caregiver is a first teacher, and each care environment is the child's first classroom. Yes, even our babies in a home environment. We have to realize that those ABC blocks on the floor are really the building blocks, the cornerstone of the child's mind when you realize that 90% of a baby's brain development of their lifetime is happening in those first five years. We cannot allow ourselves to devolve into an either-or conversation, either access or quality, either quality or rates. It's all of the above, as you've heard from all of the panelists today. Uh, all three are necessary in partnership to yield outcomes for children as well as to put parents into the workplace. As we rebuild our early learning system from the remaining bones after the Great Recession, we need to take a child-centered approach to our care systems, and that includes significant timed investments in affordability and quality systems. So you've uh, heard a little bit about uh, the programs we currently have in place. We're not starting from nothing. Um, so what more from First Five California's perspective do we need to be doing and how, in what order do we need to do it? Uh, first, as you heard from the previous panel, we have to increase our reimbursement rates and the uh, infant toddler adjustment factor. I won't belabor the issue because you've heard about it a lot today, but quality is rates. Rates are the backbone for our ratios and for compensation rates for, and turnover rates in our workforce. And so therefore, rates drive the backbone of quality and we cannot sacrifice there particularly for our babies. Uh, second, we need to support professional learning systems for all first teachers. Quality, as Deb noted, is intentional engagement and instructional practice in every care setting. We recommend significant one-time and ongoing investments in this budget year to create a systems-based approach to these professional development investments based on the goals of the quality rating and improvement system, which is still very young in California and its development and what the impact could be at the local level in care environments. And we need to look at our existing professional learning infrastructure, including our community colleges. As part of this rebuilding, we need to invest in, in a strong Prop 98 year in the professional development systems for all first teachers in all settings. Community college core curriculum, lab schools, apprenticeships or mentorships, and both credit bearing and non-credit bearing coursework statewide is needed in great amounts. And there should be a planned partnership with the CTC and other local professional learning networks and providers in order to start thinking comprehensively system-wide. Finally, we need to provide an on-ramp for family home care providers and providers of infant toddler care to be able to participate in and gain professional benefit from our quality rating and improvement system. 
Last year's investment of $50 million in ongoing Prop 98 for preschool providers who meet high quality targets was a game changer for what's happening around quality investments at the local level here in California. However, this investment leads out, leaves out our non-preschool providers. QRIS was intended and is still intended to promote higher quality care in all early learning environments. And an investment quickly is necessary in order to ensure that non-preschool folks, and particularly those caring for our babies during these very impactful years, aren't left out of professional learning opportunities and the influence that was intended by QRIS at the local level. On April 23rd, the first five California Commission will be voting on whether to refocus our own state investments towards the same goal. Instead of funding specific professional development programs as we have historically, our Commission will consider a five-year investment to improve or develop QRIS-like systems in every county or region in our state, building on the building blocks of the Race to the Top Early Learning Grant and the QRIS Block Grant. However, we know that additional support from the state for non-preschool providers will be absolutely necessary to reach all our family home, center, and license exempt providers so that each learning environment can be impacted with the experiences we know will make a difference. We urge the assembly to join us in this ongoing investment. Thank you.